Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us once again. I hope all of you are having a great day as we kick things off here. And yeah, we have a great guest. They've been on the show once before and you know, we, we really enjoyed talking to them and we are excited to see what's changed since the last time we have done so. And that's right, if you've read the show notes, Matter and Form. They are a company that, you know, they use your smartphone and it ha- and it, le- it allows any smartphone to be a 3D scanner. And we're going to talk about 3D printing, where it's come, and just 3D creations in general. It's, uh, again, it's going to be a great show. So before we get into that, a few things to mention, including ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find anything and everything having to do with today's show. That includes uh, a link to our guest website, any articles that we do later on in the program. Just, uh, you know, if you're busy, if your hands are tied, don't worry. We got you covered over at ComputerAmerica.com. And while you're there, be sure to enter the contest for Computer America. Uh, Every Friday, we give away a prize from our friends over at Logitech to a lucky listener. And yeah, we could be reading your name live on the air here in just a couple of days. And let's see, the last thing is, that's right, we have a video portion of the show that's, you know, not mandatory by any means, but it is enjoyable. So check it out, ComputerAmerica.com, live stream, and yeah, hey, just another way to experience what we do here. All right, so morning announcements are done. Why don't we go ahead and jump into today's, uh, you know, conversation. So joining us by phone is Mr. Drew Shark. He is the uh, yeah, he's the CEO of Matter Inform, and Drew, thanks for joining us here on Computer America. Amazing. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So, I think a good place to start, as usual, is at the start. Uh, you know, for those of us who don't remember, tell us, you know, kind of how the idea for Matter Inform kind of came about, and, you know, what it is exactly that you guys do. Sure. So, uh, yeah, we started in 2014. It was just me and a friend, actually. Um, uh, We weren't planning to start a business. And we needed something, uh, we needed to make something unique, and we needed a 3D scanner at the time. Everything was really expensive. They were all about $50,000, and of course, that wasn't something that I could afford. Um, So we decided to make one instead. And people got really interested. We launched a crowdfunding campaign, and it took off. And since then, we've been continuing to support and make um, these amazing desktop, um, low-cost, professional 3D scanners, um, which has done magical for us. But uh, we always kind of felt like it was missing something a little bit because, you know, it's a desktop uh, device. Uh, So then we started, uh, a couple years later, we just started to um, begin production on this really cool new device called Bevel which you mentioned uh, just a second ago, which plugs into your smartphone and turns your smartphone into essentially a 3D scanner. Um, Yeah, and so that's what we've been doing uh, just recently. Yeah, and, you know, we're going to get into, of course, Bevel and talk about your, you know, uh, the other device that is a 3D scanner. But, um, you know, obviously starting this out, it's not easy to, you know, essentially start a company. I think a lot of people from, you know, Kickstarter and the like, that we've seen, you know, it's uh, it's not the easiest way to, you know, kind of have an idea and then build a company around it and then be successful at everything that that entails. Uh, could you talk a, a bit about, you know, maybe some of your challenges? I mean, kind of how, how what is your background that you can kind of just say, yes, I want to do this and I'll make it happen. And then what were some of the challenges in making this company? Because it, you know, again, it's not for everyone. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, and I, we definitely did not succeed at everything. That's for sure. Um, yeah. So my background, actually, uh, I'm a, like a, a bit of an artist. I went to school for art. Um, I, I'm a self-taught programmer. Um, you know, I grew up with my dad being a contractor, so you know, take things apart and learn how to build things. Um, and I guess all those skills just came in handy when we when we needed to make a physical product. 
Um, and uh, yeah, and then and that's sort of my background. Um, you know, uh, the challenges were <laughs> huge uh, and many. Um, uh, I think one of the biggest ones was just that um, you know we're we're just a small company um, right now. I think we're the biggest we've ever been, and we're about 13, 15 people sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and so with such a small company and such such small people, we don't have a lot of resources, and we're always up against these big uh, corporations that have tons of money and these huge R&D teams, um, and they're in the 3D landscape. Um, you know the names; everyone knows the names of these guys. Um, and so we always have to be on our toes and stay ahead. Uh, so it's really learning to adapt and um, be nimble uh, and try and and try and compete with uh, some of these big companies. Yeah. That being well, said, though, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Uh, uh, no. Uh, please. I have uh, you know something to say, but please so, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So that being said, I think um, you know that that. That, that's been some of our biggest challenges, but the you know some of the successes um, are I think actually a lot more smaller than what most people would would uh, would um, consider. Mm -hmm. I think like our biggest success um, personally is how well our customer service is with with people. Like uh, you know when people reach out to us, we were able to help them, and I get to hear and sometimes even be uh, involved with the projects that these people are making. Um, you know, the people that buy our products are not big companies, they're individuals, and um, and so I get to hear all the really cool and amazing things that they make, um, and they, they really like to interact with us on a personal scale, because we're so small, we can actually do that. I can actually sit down with a customer and, like, talk with them, and you would never be able to do that with, uh, you know, the CEO of uh, Stratasys or something like that. Right. No, and and that's, uh, that's super important. I mean, I think that customer service for you know, and and I don't blame them whatsoever. Like when you think about the Googles and the Facebooks of the world, you know, when you have a billion customers, when you have, you know, when you serve, you know, seven, you know, two billion people, it's it's, uh, you know, you're talking to, you're talking to a computer. That's the way it has to be done. But very very sure. cool, yeah, very cool that you definitely enjoy, uh, you know, that personal aspect to it. And what I was going to mention, you know, kind of before was. Uh, you are going up against companies that have, you know, probably a lot more resources, but I will say that, you know, and you, you can kind of uh, speak to this, but I mean, one thing that has definitely had to have helped you because, you know, the iPhone event just happened. Uh, there's a new Samsung phone. I mean, there, uh, the new pixel was just announced and every one of them time by time again, they, they all say that, Hey, we have the best camera. And, you know, a lot of your, uh, business and technology is built around the idea that the camera in your smartphone is, you know, isn't just a play thing. It can be a serious tool. I mean, just before we get into anything else, uh, how, how has it been, you know, kind of having Apple I I and, there. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, there, I got you. Nope. Uh, per, per, yeah. Sorry about that. So yeah, I wanted you to kind of comment on the fact that while you may not have the most resources, you are essentially leveraging, uh, Google and Apple and, uh, you know, Samsung, to essentially build your cameras for you, right? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an advantage. Uh, you know, in the desktop scanner that we have, we had to, you know, source and build our own cameras and things like that, and it's been difficult. Um, but this is this has its own challenges, but but smartphones are definitely have some of the best technology and the most advanced technology in the world, and we love to, to take advantage of it. The cameras are amazing on the newest phones. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty spectacular in, in terms of what they do. And uh, more to that, uh, you're talking about the Pixel and you're talking about the iPhone. Um, they, uh, they've also come out with new technologies that, that support us in other ways too, which is um, augmented reality, which I don't think we talked about this before, but um, augmented reality is like a really massive um, way of immersing yourself in, in creating content um, and, and, and sharing that content and being part of other people's creations. Um, and, and yet, uh, we have this amazing facility to do augmented reality on the iPhone and, uh, coming soon on, on Google. Um, but, uh, but then there's no way to actually create this content. Um, you know, I, I can create photography and video, mm -hmm. um, but, but there's really no way to create uh, 3d easily for, for everyone. And that's actually really where we want it to be. So it's, it's excellent to see this stuff coming out right at the right time. It's funny that you mentioned that. Like, I don't know if um, you know if AR, VR, like if we're getting these uh, you know these publicists who are just kind of you know trying to get all these guests on the show at the same time. But 
Uh, just yesterday on the show, we were talking to a company. Let me go back and check. Uh, Mant VR, and it was started by a gentleman, uh, you know, whose last name happened to be Mant, but he is a big time Hollywood producer. He's made like three thousand shows and blah blah blah. He had a very very impressive resume. He you know kind of quit all that because he saw the shift from traditional television, and he saw. You know, the way that he felt medium, and, you know, and he's not exactly, you know, unsuccessful in his field, but he saw the mm-hmm. way that augmented reality, virtual reality was going to be some of the most consumed, you know, kind of media in the future. And he started up a company to exclusively pursue AR and VR. So you're kind of, you awesome. know, yeah, I, I mean, go ahead. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Like, I mean, he's, I, I think, I, I mean, I, I didn't, I unfortunately didn't hear the show, but, um, uh, but I, I'm, it's, I'm glad he has the same vision. Yeah. Uh, it, it's true. I mean, um, we grew up like as a, you know, I have a, a new, a new son, um, and I watch him, you know, learning with stuff and it's, it's, everything is 3d, everything's tactile. You're picking things up and you're experiencing your world in 3d. You hear in partly 3d, you see in 3d, um, you know, you feel in 3d and, and yet, we're stuck on these digital devices that are flat um, and they try to give you 3D sort of, um, but, but then AR and VR, they really break down the walls there and um, they bring you closer to, to um, you know, being able to experience these things the way that you grew up learning right. it. And it, you, can, you can really see it when you give a piece of technology like AR to you know, like on the weekend, it's, um, we're in Canada. So we had Thanksgiving this weekend and I was able to actually show one of our new things to my mom, who's really not the best, uh, technically. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, uh, you know, she has one of these iPhone sixes and she's able to walk around this object in the scene. Uh, one of the objects that we created and, and experience it. And it's so intuitive for her. Like there's no, she doesn't have to think about it. Like she just actually starts walking around it, uh, without any instruction. And I think that really speaks heavily to how, if we get closer to breaking down those walls and, and immersing people more into the, uh, into the things that they already know, the more disruptive this can actually be and the more, um, you know, more engaging it can be. And as a storytelling platform, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. I think it's, I think it's definitely going to be the future. Right. Yeah. And, and that was a word that came up often was the term disruptive. So, and you know, Hey, I think that your technology here at the same time is also disruptive. Like you said, uh, you know, bringing the cost to create that kind of content, bringing the cost down by thousands of dollars is, you know, something that needs to happen if we're going to have, you know, that kind of content for people to, or if we're going to have enough people uh, to create that kind of content. So before we get any further into the implications, let's talk about what it is that you have, because I think last time you were on the program, we talked about your your desktop kind of 3D scanner. Uh, Talk, mm-hmm. And, you know, for anyone out there watching the video portion, we have an image of it up here and, you know, we're kind of showing your website. But, uh, you know, talk about the, you know, your, uh, yeah, your 3D scanner and then let's talk about Bevel. Let's talk about, you know, your technology. Sure. So, um, yeah, so the so desktop scanner, again, is, a, you know, it's a couple of years old for us, but we've been developing it um, consistently for those, those last couple of years. Um, it is uh, still the best-selling 3D scanner in the market, uh, despite us being a tiny company. Um, we sell more 3D scanners in the world than any other um, than any other competitor. Um, we uh, it's it's a tenth of the price in some cases. Um, our next competitor, we're about uh, we're about a quarter of the price, um, and we get similar resolutions, um, and, but the cost is is way better. And um, and we've been doing a lot of work to try to try to try to make sure that that works uh, with as many um, you know with with as mu- as many people as possible with as much technology as possible without adding constraints like having to have super heavy computers or anything like that. Right. And yeah. um, during that, sorry. Go ahead. No, uh, oh, no. And uh, I, I just uh, want to tell everyone out there that if you check out the video portion, um, you know, we are checking out some of your 3D models. Like, you know, right now we're just kind of, you know, spinning a hammer around. And it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 you know, it's very impressive. You can see a lot of detail, uh, you know, that I think if you were trying to draw or render, you know, a hammer, that I think a lot of people would, you know, kind of either gloss over it or not catch it. And, you know, like the indents in the handle and things like that. Uh, very, very impressive scanner. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, we, we, um, we've pitted ourselves against some of the competitors and have, 
uh, you know, com I think we're we're pretty comparable, especially when we're um, we're uh, uh, you know the the next up competitors like Next Engine. They're we're pretty right. close in in terms of quality. Right. Oh, and 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 so uh, and so you've been developing this over a while, but it's uh, but generally it's uh, pretty much the same uh, standard that you had for a couple of years now. So I guess a good way to you know kind of segue this is your new project. And hey, look, there's a cat. So uh, tell us about <laughs> Bevel. What is Bevel? So Bevel is sort of the um, if if the if the desktop scanner is what we we sort of refer to it as prosumer. You know, people that are starting businesses and professional people that have some small knowledge of 3D. Um, Bevel was there to um, take down that wall and really try to start to allow people to create in 3D who have never heard of 3D. You know, have never really even thought about 3D. And um, so Bevel is this uh, small device that plugs into your phone. And uh, it's actually um, a little uh, a little computer with a with a laser and a battery, and it it gives your phone the one missing element um, that allows you to create 3D easily. And so we built really the magic is in the is in the app. Uh, so you download the app and you plug in the the bevel, and then you just wipe this laser line uh, that comes out of the bubble over top of whatever it is you're trying to capture. And it, it, uh, it produces it right there on your phone. It doesn't work uh, on the cloud. It's all local. Um, so you don't need internet access to do anything. Um, you know, there's no like pay per model or anything like, like ridiculous, like some other places. So, and, um, and you can just create these three dimensional models right on your phone and you use them in a similar way as you use uh, your photograph. So if I want to share my photo with someone, um, you know, I'll tap it and hit share and then I'll text it to them or I'll put it up on Facebook. So we do the same thing. You can share that 3D file with anybody. They don't have to have the app. Um, so we host, uh, we host these 3D files online on our cloud service uh, for free. And um, whoever, uh, whoever wants to go and view them can totally go and view them. Um, you can keep them private. You can, you can share them on different social networks. It's, uh, we did a lot of work to really um, give the framework for everyone to just cr start creating in 3d and, and and sharing in 3d yeah and it sounds and you know uh, great for you guys hosting it because i was I was wondering if you know i i don't think that a lot of uh, operating systems out there can you know come natively with the software to you know kind of view these these renders so you know good on you for kind of hosting that so let's uh, and you know just uh you know just some technical stuff I, how would someone go about using it? I mean, you know, uh, how would someone go about using this to get the best image? Uh, do they have to know about lighting? Do they have to know about angles? Um, you know, how intuitive is making one of these 3D objects? So, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think whatever you're using, whether it's um, our product or, or anyone's product, there's always a bit of a, um, you know, a bit of a learning curve. Um, I think that it's, it's fairly intuitive. We have some pretty simple tutorials in the app and then you go through it and, you know, I've watched people um, do it without, without any conversation and they've been successful. Um, other people, uh, you know, they learn by uh, trial and error. So they, they take some stuff and then they, you know, they can kind of see what worked and what didn't. Um, not everything's going to work, right? It's a, it's a laser. So if you're trying to scan, you know, a, a glass, um, or a pair of glasses or something like that, it might be a little challenging. Uh, there's definitely some limitations because, you know, laser light is is important to reflect off of an object properly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a bit of uh, there's a bit of learning. Lighting is also um, important because again, it's a it's a laser light. So right now, the very current version of the software doesn't work in direct sunlight, um, but we're we're changing that. Uh, the next couple of app releases will have some new uh, some new creations for us or some new technology in there that let you. Um, let you uh, capture in, in direct sunlight, and it'll be much more uh, much more easy to use as well. Right. So, and and you know, uh, can it tell different materials? You mentioned you know glass and things like that. I mean, when you get the 3D render, is it just going to look like one you know kind of solid form, or uh, because I was actually looking at you know your, your render of the device itself, it has a little jack, and uh, actually we we're going to have to talk about that because I don't think many. Uh, phones or at least some of the newer phones don't have that 3.5 millimeter jack anymore but mm -hmm. 
you know, can it tell different materials or does it give you one solid image and then you kind of have to, you know, designate this is wood, this is cloth, this is blah, blah, blah. So it, it applies a applies a texture to it. So it applies the image um, from the from the scan uh, to the model, and um, and so it's it's very much painted on as one sort of material. But if you um, so if you know 3D, it'll be it'll just be one material. Okay. Um, if you want to go and edit it later, that's um, okay. that's you know that that's easy enough to do. But uh, but yeah, I mean, we we did a little bit of work here and there on different models to be able to uh, do that. But um, but yeah, that's. That's yeah. pretty standard to, to sort of do work afterwards. Yeah. So, and, you know, and again, uh, does this use a 3.5 millimeter jack or uh, how does this connect to your phone? Yeah. So, um, right now, the 3.5 millimeter jack is the only available bevel. We do um, give away some adapters to, uh, to, to people who need it, um, or we actually have, um, for now, this is just our temporary solution. Right. There's actually a couple of files up there that you can print if you have a 3D printer that will let you use your, uh, your adapters. Um, soon we'll have a, we'll a USB-C and, and a lightning jack uh, version. And, um, and uh, also, you may not even need the hardware in the near future. Um, <laughs> I think so, so there's been some uh, developments there, so that's pretty exciting too. But uh, if you're looking for like accuracy and scale, you're going to need this uh, adapter no matter what phone you have. Right. Um, so that's, yeah. Right. No, and, and it's, uh, you know, of course, very important to note, but most phones do come with that adapter. Uh, just good to know that you do work with that adapter. So let's see. Um, we have, you know, a... Uh, we have a question here about what have people historically been creating three uh i'm sorry what have people historically created with 3d capture and where do you think it's going in the near future so essentially you know i think because a lot of people don't have access to this kind of technology they don't create 3d technology or i'm sorry they don't create 3d objects they don't create 3d images what mm -hmm. you know, what have they kind of created in the past and where do you hope to see maybe the average consumer or, you know, the more this proliferates, what do you hope people actually create 3D images of when they, you know, when they have the choice? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, actually, because 3D, um, 3D files or 3D things have traditionally been, um, you know, part of engineering and um, industrial uh, manufacturing. Um, and then obviously there's been, you know, 3D files that have been created for video games and, uh, and movies is the big one. Um, you know, but uh, since we've had our desktop scanner, which has really lowered the bar for people to, to start creating in 3D, we're seeing a lot more in archaeology and um, anthropology. Um, and we're seeing a lot more in art now because artists don't typically spend a lot of money on, on technologies. Um, and so now they, now they are. Um, and uh, or now they have the ability to get something like that. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of, uh, of people just experimenting with 3D in, in ways that I never imagined. Um, I think the big ones though for, for us is that um, we see that uh, 3D creation is really moving. The, I think the first place it's gonna be used is in e-commerce and uh, like the first major spot that we're gonna see uh, 3D just you know explode is gonna be in e-commerce because right now uh, you know, people buy online all the time. I, I mean, I definitely buy all my Christmas presents online, but um, you know, everything's done with regular flat two-dimensional images and video. And I think that video was sort of a, a, a nice step up from regular two-dimensional images. Uh, but we can we can definitely do better. And if people who own these stores and own these products uh, are interested in in getting you know more sales and getting getting people to experience their products better, they're going to want to step up to uh, to showing off their product in 3D. And when it's really easy and it's in your browser and there's no downloads for your user and it's instant, um, you know, 3D, uh, being able to spin a product around and actually like zoom into it and see all the details that you can't do that with, a, with just a regular photo um, is, pretty, is pretty amazing. And then combine that with augmented reality. Now all of a sudden, if I'm buying a pair of shoes or say I'm buying a table or for my, you know, for my front foyer and I want to, see what it looks like in, the, in, in my front foyer, I can actually use augmented reality, place it into the scene, and then walk around it, um, you know, and, and make that decision as to whether, you know, I want to buy that thing or not. Um, and I think that that immersion there is, is really what's going to, um, you know, jumpstart e-commerce into 3D.
Yeah, it, it, it seems like a couple different applications there. I'm, you know, uh, you had a 3D image of a sock. I mean, it, it'd be kind of cool to, uh, you know, capture a detailed enough image of, say, your hands or your feet, um, you know, something, you know, something as simple as that. And then maybe ordering out for shoes. Shoes are made, you know, directly for you uh, using the measurements that you kind of provide in the scan that you provide. I mean, that would be, you know, super, super cool. I, again, I'll just check out your website, your, um, sorry, your blog. And, you know, uh, June 2017, you have an image here of two people looks to be in a park and, uh, you know, the bevel's actually able to capture their faces. You're right. I, I mean, it's, um, it's not pixel perfect, you know, artist kind of level, but it's super impressive to kind of see these, you know, uh, you know, these two people's faces actually come out and separate from the background. It's, uh, you know, just super, super impressive. Um, have you had any, um, and I'm sure there, there, you know, must've been at least a few, uh, any interest because, you know, uh, this Friday we have, uh, our friend from, from Autodesk on, and have you had any organizations such as Autodesk, um, you know, kind of reach out to you and say that, Hey, you know, we really like what you're doing. Uh, have you worked with any other companies to, you know, to kind of, yeah, you know, bring the technology about? <laughs> um, so when we were, when we were a little younger, um, you know, that was right when 3D printing was, was exploding. Uh, we were very, very vocal. I think that was actually around the same time that in the first time we chatted with you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we were very vocal and we, there were, there were quite a few companies who were sort of interested in getting into the space, but they were really more interested in, uh, the future of 3D and, and creating content was going to be a necessity for 3D printing. Um, since then, uh, we've decided to be as quiet as possible, <laughs> and uh, and and not for not not for any uh, nefarious reasons, but um, because we're a small we're a small team and and you know, we need to keep our head down and and really work on this to make sure that it's amazing. And now, finally, uh, you know, we've got something that you can actually buy right now. Uh, there's a, you know, there's uh, updates every day, and there's new technologies coming out all the time that support this, uh, you know, support our platform. Um, I so so I can't say anything, but there's definitely uh, there's just, there's been some conversations. I'm always open for more, though, if anyone's listening. Okay, no, and, and uh, makes makes perfect sense. That's uh, that's very very interesting, but. Um, let's talk about, uh, you know, some of the early adopters for this technology, where you kind of anticipate this, because, you know, you mentioned that in, uh, you know, in the virtual marketplace, in, you know, kind of e-commerce, something like this is definitely going to be essential to what they do. But, um, you know, and, and we've seen the likes of, let's, I think it's like Home, Home Depot, Lowe's or Ikea, some of those are, you know, kind of doing what you said before, being able to, mm -hmm. uh, use augment, uh, augmented reality. Uh, you know, are they the first, are they going to be the first uh, content creators or are you expecting it to take off in other fields as well? Well, I mean, um, you know, bring up Lowe's is pretty good, but um, uh, there's, there's also Ikea, which was Apple's launch, right? So Apple launched right. their AR kit with Ikea, but I Ikea actually already builds all their content in 3d. Most people don't know this, but they're, they're all their brochures are 3d rendered. Um, even though they look photo real. So they, uh, they don't even shoot anything anymore. So everything is it's already 3D created. And so that content is already part of their process. You know, they have a big company and they create these 3D models and that's, they have like 3D modelers on staff and, and that's definitely part of it. Um, so anyone who has 3D models uh, already or has access to some sort of um, process like that, I think are going to be, you know, the first to take advantage of things like AR and, and other places like that. But that still makes it really difficult for people who don't have access to it. So that's why we, that's why we're trying to break down those walls and give people technology that can actually, you know, that they can use, like, you know, anyone listening right now can, can use this. Um, I think the, the, the people, the type of people who are going to be creating, um, you know, right off the bat, we've already, you know, we've already shipped our first batch of, of bevels, uh, you know, early, like um, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. And the people who are creating are, um, you know, artists and, and, you know, just early adopters and people who really just want to be part of the technology and help us grow the, the company and help us grow the, the technology. After that, I think, I think it absolutely is going to be e-commerce because they have the, uh, they have the money. Uh, to spend on, on um, you know, even even though it is very affordable, they they have the money to invest in something like, like this, or even more importantly, they have the time to um, to 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 learn something to in order to grow their business, right? Right. Um, and uh, it it just seems like the most practical use case. Unlike when 3D printing sort of came around, we were all sort of looking for those use cases as much as possible. I think that 
3D scanning has been around for so long and growing for so long that this is 3D and scanning it's time Drew, to shine. Uh, and, and Drew, uh, would you mind staying over for a couple minutes so we can do a proper send off? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, everyone, the music means we're going to take a break. Commercial right after this and uh, Computer America and Matter and Form. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. Hello, and welcome back to the Computer America Show. We are talking to the one, the only, Mr. Drew Shark. He is the CEO for Matter and Form. If you want to check them out or anything else that we talk about today, ComputerAmerica.com, we have a link directly to Matter and Form. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, MatterInform.net. There we go, .net. So uh, with that being said, Drew, thanks for staying over. And, you know, uh, something I wanted to kind of get into real quick, um, you brought up 3D printing that, you know, that popped into my mind a bit too, where, you know, when 3D printing was first kind of making its way into the field and, you know, it was at first in the 90s and, you know, what have you, it was strictly for, uh, you know, large industrial organizations. And then uh, additive 3D printing kind of made its way into the, ho the, the hobbyist or the enthusiast. Uh, you know, some got it down to like $100, but, you know, I'd say about four to $1,000 was about the range for 3D printer. And mm -hmm. I'll, you know, I'll be the first to admit that th uh, we talked a lot about the idea that every home, just like you have a microwave, just like you have uh, an oven, you're going to have a 3D printer to, you know, create small objects that you would use around your home. I don't think that that kind of adoption has happened, um, you know, and that future is looking a little iffy, but the idea of having a 3D printer yeah, I'm sorry, a 3D printing kind of like Kinko's where you can go and use their 3D printers, uh, you know, for a fraction of the price, that is, you know, seems more likely. So when you say about the adoption of 3D scanning and, you know, using 3D scanners, um, you know, for the individual, it might work. But I mean, is that really the, what do you kind of view as the end game for 3D scanning? Is it, uh, you know, going to be like a center and, or, you know, a place where people can go and get scanned or do you think there's real want need for you know people to have the ability to 3d scan themselves i um i think it's a that's a great question i think actually the 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 answer to that is that i don't see 3d scanning as as uh you know a technology i see it as um i see 3d as a medium like the same way that we still listen to radio that we still read books and that we still you know watch movies Mm -hmm. um, there are other types of medium out there, and I, I just see 3D as a missing component. It's, it's the missing medium that we, we just haven't uh, fully embraced yet. I think that um, when we call it 3D scanning, it has this really technical kind of feel to it um, yeah. that you need to you know, know a lot about it. And there might be some places out there, and I know there are actually already in, in Toronto that scan things for you, and, and maybe that's you know, what you need if you need some high-resolution stuff. But creating this content, the way that I create content for YouTube or the way I create content for my blog, needs to happen um, on a 3D level. And so it's all about being disruptive. If we can find a technology that fits into the uh, devices that we already have without adding extra things like the bevels and add-on, if we can do that without the, the add-on, then I think, uh, then I think it's, it's going to be um, content that's created by everyone. You know who would really go gaga over this? And, uh, you know, they... 
they're one of the major pushers of AR at the moment. Uh, it, you know, was Pokemon Go, and that got everyone you know kind of paying attention to it. But uh, Snapchat, like I have tons of friends on, on right. Snapchat, <laughs> and they've been using AR. Like everyone has their little uh, uh, 3D avatar. I forgot what they're called, but you know, Snapchat uses AR like crazy. Do you think something like Bevel would, you know, again, if you could do it in real time, uh, you know, kind of extrude and you know make a 3D image of yourself? There's always been this thing about yeah. a and 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 just real quick, I mean, there's always been this thing about AR that any overlaid data image, whatever, is kind of in front of you. Like you can't put your hand out and it can't go behind your hand. Um, do you right, think right. you know your technology is the it's a solution to that where AR is more three dimensional at that point? Uh, totally. Yeah, I absolutely think that's happening because we're we're building that right now. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think socially, uh, Snapchat um, is in a really interesting place, and and they're difficult to sort of imagine anyone else coming in and playing in that world because Snapchat is just a really you know unusual but uh, super popular thing. But I, I think that um, creating you know creating 3D on on the fly, yeah, that's an excellent example, right? Is as being able to include things with. Um, you know, and, and yeah. even even just video games, just playing that properly um, with things occluded on your desk, I think that's that would be really cool. Yeah, it, it and, and and video games is a uh, you know definitely another one of those because uh, especially for augmented reality, it's it's always a little disconcerting when you don't have any point of reference of yourself, and you know you can watch AR and, right. all, and it's all great, but the minute you kind of put your hand out and your hand blocks something that should be ten feet away, or you know, yeah. or, or or your hand is behind it's something. Unnerving. Yeah, it's it definitely throws you out. So, uh, very very cool that you guys are working on that. It's uh, it it's gonna have to be the next step for AR. So, speaking of next steps, I think a good way to kind of wrap this up is obviously you've been you know kind of uh, teasing, hinting at the fact that the bevel seems to be a a middle child of a technology, and you know it sounds like there, you have a lot of projects in the works. What's next for Matter and Form? Yeah. So um, yeah, we're working on uh, we're working on developing out the platform that shares the 3D content right now, and um, and so right now it's free. Everyone can use it. It's called BevelPix. You don't have to have any of our devices. You can actually upload content from um, anywhere from any 3D creation tool. But um, and and so we're working on that to be a bit more robust and, and a lot more usable for uh, as many people as possible. And then it's the technologies that are behind Bevel that we really want to support the most. So we you know talk about um, being able to uh, scan without the Bevel is definitely the next uh, is the next thing. Um, after that, it's it's I, I'm kind of surprised you hit this so quickly, but yeah, it was a, the like uh, real-time scanning is, is a big um, must for us as well. You know, speed and um, letting people do stuff quickly and intuitively is is uh, what we're all about, or what we're trying right. to achieve anyways. Yeah, I, I, you know, one of the perks of doing this, and for anyone out there listening, I mean, we talk to uh, not just content creators, but technologies such as yourself, and, you know, we even talk to consumers, our listeners, about what they want, and I, you are, uh, Drew, you're on the right path, and Looking forward to talking with Matter Inform, you know, in in another year and see, hey, if you guys have <laughs> actually done it, because this is an exciting field, and you know, your your position well. Yeah, I'm super excited. Thanks for having me on the show. It's, it's yeah, lots of fun. It, it, it was great, everyone. Once again, Mr. Drew Shark, he is the CEO for Matter Inform. If you want to find out more, MatterInform.net, and of course, you can find all about the bevel there as uh, yeah, the bevel there as well, and a link in the show notes at Computer America. Drew. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, talk to you next time. Thanks so much, Ben. All right, have a great one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, there he goes, and there you have it. So that's a uh, you know, very, very interesting place to be, and definitely looking forward to that. So if you, uh, yeah, again, like I said, if you want to find out more, ComputerAmerica.com. So with, uh, with that being said, why don't we move on to computer and technology news? And we have, you know, plenty of time to get into a number of these articles that, uh, you know, you should really hear about. So here we go. Computer and Technology News brought to you by Fire Dragon Security. All right. All right. All right. We have a couple of stories that I definitely want to get to. And yeah, this one is a bit of a futuristic one but at the same time it's one that 
is going to have to be addressed, and it looks like they're trying to address it already. Because, you know, it's uh, it's kind of the near future for the implications and being very vague, you know, obviously, but the, you know, the possibility is in the next five to ten years, but then the realization of uh, the changes won't happen for another 18, 20 years after that. And what I'm talking about is the fact that the anti-doping agency, and, you know, they handle sports, they're very much, you know, uh, for as long as there have been sports, there have been people trying to bend the rules, find ways to make themselves better at those said sports, because, hey, let's face it, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of money and a lot of fame to be earned for being the best, and being the best, there's, uh, okay, let's put it this way, if everyone is lifting the barbell a hundred times, then, you know, what more can you do? Of course, you can, you know, lift, try to lift more, but everyone's trying to lift more, so, there are ways around it. There are things you can do to make yourself better. And, you know, that goes for everything from doping, steroids, uh, and many, many other things. Well, cheating's not going to end. And it looks like what kind of maybe can be considered a cheat, the anti-doping agency or um, the world anti-doping agency is starting to take a stance against gene editing. Yeah, that's right. So CRISPR, we talked about CRISPR here on the show before, and we've mainly been focused on the ability to change the genetics of someone who maybe has a disease or a pre or you know maybe a pre-existing condition to you know be uh, receptive to cancer or things like you know cancer tumors, uh, sickle cell anemia, things like that. Uh, you could potentially cure all of these if you were able to get into their genetics, change their genome, and, you know, fix the little, you know, the little changes in their genes that make them a carrier or make them receptive to those. Well, you can also do other things, and this is a part that we haven't touched on, and it's the idea that you use gene editing to, let's say, if you want someone to, you know, grow to a certain height, if you, you know, maybe if, you want your kid to be a basketball player, you alter the genes that affect height, you, you know, kind of go about and make them six foot ten, and you give them great cardio, you make sure that their heart, you know, the genes that control their heart functions make that super efficient. Essentially, you make a super athlete through gene editing. And while this has never been done, And so far, gene editing is mainly focused on the ability to, you know, kind of cure diseases. It also has that possibility. So starting next year, and by the way, this is from Engadget, saying that starting next year, the list of banned substances includes gene editing agents designed to alter genome sequences and or the transcriptional or epigenetic regulation of gene expression. There you have it. So these, they're trying to get out ahead of it again because it's never been done, but they know that the possibility is there. Saying that, you know, if you're thinking that sounds a lot like CRISPR gene editing, the new rule seems to be targeting just that. And as it stands, WADA, or again, the anti, the World Anti-Doping Agency, already bars genetically modified cells and other types of gene therapy that can enhance performance, but the existing rules don't cover CRISPR type methods. Very interesting. So the agency said that the certain types of medical gene therapy might be allowed as long as they don't significantly enhance athletic prowess. So, you know, just because you had your genes edited to, let's say, uh, remove sickle cell anemia, you'd still be allowed to compete. It's just as long as your cells, you know, as long as your genes aren't uh, edited to allow increased oxygen to, you know, uh, I'm sorry, your red, your red blood cells to increase oxygen retention, things like that. Um, yeah, so they're being pretty general about it, but also very, very specific. They said that generally, performance enhancement implies enhancement beyond a return to normal, although you may appreciate that this is not always easy to prove definitively. So, while the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency seems to be well ahead of any actual cheating, 
Only one CRISPR trial with humans has been completed, a form of lung cancer treatment done at, uh, you know, at a hospital, I'm sorry, at a university in China. And they said that, uh, yeah, and, and they said that dozens more, dozens more are planned in the nation where unlike regular drug doping, CRISPR relies on sophisticated, expensive equipment and techniques, so it's not like shady MDs can do it at, in their garages for now. Of course, you know, the price of, you know, the price of gene editing right now is at an all-time high because it's new technology and, hey, you know, it's still in the lab, but CRISPR is a technology that the price will come down dramatically, and I've said this before on the show. There will be a time when no child is not born without CRISPR, uh, you know, kind of done to them. Because if you could eliminate all these diseases, if you could eliminate cancer, you're definitely going to do that. So, again, they're getting out ahead of it, and they it seems pretty good, you know, if uh, if you can kind of ban doping from world sports. Although, I don't know, I, I'll get to the other the other side of this but uh they're saying that it's a good thing that wada doesn't have anyone to catch yet because it doesn't really seem to have any detection methods so when quizzed by new scientists they said that uh, about how it plans to catch gene editing cheaters the agency had no response because it's not traceable you know it's just their genetic makeup and there's no real way to kind of tell if something was edited it's just kind of part of them now you know, it's not an additive, it's editing. So they said that it's been working on techniques to detect such doping for over 10 years, but only came up with a single test last year. And for now, the best method might be the biological passport that can detect significant changes in an athlete's body. So I guess they kind of take a before snapshot of when you first you know, kind of join a- uh, athletics, and then they can compare your genes to your genes in the future see if you've had any work done uh not the best case whatsoever but or at least not the best uh, the best uh detection method now the personal the gut feeling for me part of me is like i'm not saying that you edit someone's genes to grow them a third arm out of their chest so that they're a better you know uh baseball player or something like that i'm not saying that you deform or disfigure or compromise one's quality of life through gene editing. But if you want to be an athlete and you want to improve lung, uh, improve lung function, if you want to improve organ function, if you want to make yourself stronger, better, faster, and you know, you have the infrastructure behind you, why wouldn't we allow people to perform at the theoretical maximum and i know for the anti-doping agency that doesn't seem fair but i'm not talking about taking horse you know uh horse steroids to become better because those have a lot of negative side effects but if you can do these positive changes without any negative side effects why wouldn't we want you know why wouldn't we give this to everyone not just athletes why wouldn't we have everyone uh you know be you know, be stronger, be more healthy, their organs are, you know, more sturdy, have bones that don't break. I mean, why wouldn't we do this kind of thing? So for now, it seems like they don't want an uneven playing field, but eventually down the road, you know, I, I don't see this rule standing forever. It's change is going to happen. It's just a question of how much change is going to happen. So there you have it, anti-doping. If you are a gene-edited uh, abnormality, well, you may be in trouble and you may not be allowed to compete. All right, so with uh, with that being said, and I have probably made a couple sports fanatics mad, let's check out this one. And, you know, if we're going to take on sports, we might as well take on guns and YouTube. You know them. Hey, we actually broadcast live on YouTube. YouTube. Bans gun, con- uh, I'm sorry, gun conver- uh, conversion tutorials. YouTube bans gun conversion tutorials. So, yep, obviously we all know the tragedy that happened in Las Vegas. And we know that there were some, uh, you know, there was, there was some contraband lifted from the, uh, you know, the shooter. 
that he turned perfectly legal firearms into illegal firearms using uh, equipment that was purchased, again, also legally. Well, not going to get into any kind of gun debate, but YouTube seems to be banning videos that show viewers exactly how to do what the killer did. Saying that the company says that the decision is an expansion of a pre-existing policy it has against harmful and dangerous content. And this, the you know, this reporting by The Hill, they're saying that we, and this is again a quote from YouTube, saying that we have long had a policy against harmful or dangerous content. And in the wake of the recent tragedy in Las Vegas, we have taken a closer look at videos that demonstrate how to convert firearms to make them fire more quickly, and we've expanded our existing policy to prohibit these videos. YouTube, if you guys don't know, uh, it has a lot of videos and a lot of tutorials. I mean, that is probably one of, uh, you know, of course, other than cat videos and entertainment videos, and of course, Computer America, their ha YouTube's how-to section is incredible everyone who is an expert has put a video up online to show you how to fix a pipe to show you how to dig a ditch to show you how to build a house to show you how to do just about anything and that would never exclude you know kind of guns and, and modifying guns well it looks like that they are targeting these bump stocks specifically and have added them to their terms uh, you know in their policy the company will also ban videos that sell and promote firearms as well as conversion devices and bump stocks, both of which allow semi-automatic guns to fire similar to automatic ones. All right. So uh, they said that uh, YouTube began reviewing its policy in regards to guns after the shooting. And they said that initial searches show that some types of gun modification tutorials, including those about bump stocks, are still visible on the video platform. Again, their how-to section on YouTube is fast and it is in-depth, so I doubt they'll be able to catch everything right off the bat or even ever, but it's going to be a lot harder to search for certain kinds of gun modification tutorials. That's part of YouTube being a private company. They can do what they want on their platform and they can discriminate how they see fit. Uh, whether or not this is you know, kind of the best way to go about it, I don't know, but uh, yeah, YouTube is taking a hardline stance against videos that show people how to, you know, modify guns in an illegal fashion. There you have it. So, 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 with that being said, and oh, yeah, let's do something a little more upbeat. And I really like this one because it's never going to happen, but. It hilariously, according to the Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial Index, yeah, it kind of did. So Dow Jones technical error spreads fake news story of Google acquiring Apple. Personally, I thought it'd be the other way around. I thought Apple would have the money to buy Google, but here we go. So this didn't happen, but for the Dow Jones, you know, they have a news feed that feeds information to investors of relevant uh, information. And one of the relevant stories that they served up to their investors was the fact that maybe, hey, Google was, sell um, Google was purchasing Apple. That would be big news for a stock market. Well, the Dow Jones Newswires had a technical error, as they called it, which caused the portal to report several spurious stories including several headlines claiming that Google was acquiring Apple for about $9 billion and that the deal was prearranged with Steve Jobs and his will. So, yeah, a couple things there. Uh, Steve Jobs' will, uh, saying that he would hand the company over to Google for $9 billion, when I think that Apple has something to the effect of like 70, uh, was it 72 billion? No, they have like hundreds of billions. Yeah, they have like hundreds of billions of dollars in cash reserves, and then even more than that in, uh, you know, in markets, in market value. So to sell an incredible loss, there you go. But it was reported. So obviously every element of the story is made up, but it's pretty funny to see the temporal blip 
on the Apple stock price, which briefly spiked at $158. By the way, right now, well, it said that uh, it's $156. So not too far off from its uh, you know, blip there. So while the contents of the story make it obvious that the news was completely fake, and by the way, if you're watching the video portion, we have the, you know, we have the statement here, and it's pretty funny. It says that, uh, quote, in a surprise move to everyone who is alive, Google said that it will be buying Apple for $9 billion. And Google chief executive Larry Page had secret talks with the now deceased Steve Jobs in 2010 to firm up the deal. The deal was announced when Jobs' uh, will, will was read in Cupertino, California. And the deal, which is expected to close tomorrow, gives each Google shareholder nine shares of Apple stock. Obviously, Google will move into Apple's fancy headquarters. Google employees said, Yay. So, yeah, that's, um, obviously that was the content in, in its entirety of the, uh, of the newswire. But, uh, obviously fake, but it did, um, yeah, it did cause a little bit of market update. So, uh, by the way, Dow Jones provided the following statement saying that please disregard the headline that ran on Dow Jones uh, between, you know, hey, they gave the time that this was ran, saying that uh, due to a technical error, the headline was published. All of the headlines are being removed from the wires. We apologize for the error. Now, here's what probably did happen. Either A, Someone wrote up a fictitious story kind of as a placeholder and they never meant for it to be pushed out to go live and to be sent to all of their recipients. And it was an accident. You know, someone wrote it up as a joke. Obviously, if you read the text, it, you know, kind of does read as a joke. And it was an accident. Or two, someone hacked into the system or someone gained access into their system and was able to push it out uh, you know, despite not being supposed to, or, or at least you know, not, not being allowed to, and they're able to infiltrate the system. So one has implications of, well, someone's going to get a, you know, it's going to get an earful. And the other has implications of, well, you're going, you know, new, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Dow Jones newswire has been compromised. And that's not a good thing because those are very, very, important to a lot of people and a lot of investors and if you can make any kind of news this one was obviously fake but if you can make something that looks a little bit more real you can cause a lot of havoc in the stock market so let's hope it wasn't that one so for anyone out there just tuning in google is not acquiring apple for nine billion dollars it was a joke there you have it so all right so some of the other stories that we aren't going to get to today there was a story i really wanted to uh kind of get to about nvidia and you know when we talk about nvidia we don't always discuss their future with self-driving cars but yeah nvidia is kind of betting on that and they have a lot you know if you check out their if you check out their stock price it's shown over the past couple of years how they transitioned from uh mainly a consumer focused company to the company that provides the graphics cards uh, for supercomputers, for AI, for self-driving cars, they are the market leader in providing these chips. Well, NVIDIA has announced today, and this coming to us from Reuters, and they said that Silicon Valley graphics chip maker NVIDIA unveiled on Tuesday, today, the first computer chips for, full, uh, for developing fully autonomous vehicles and said it had more than 25 customers working to build a new class of driverless cars, robo taxis, and long haul trucks. So, yep, and uh, you know, I again can't get into it. Music means we have to take a break, but this is a big deal because the technology, the processing power needed to take in all the information, that was the missing piece of the puzzle. Now we have that. Now it's just a matter of who can implement it first. So, off to the races they go. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Computer America. This was a lot of fun, of course. And if you missed any part of the show, check out ComputerAmerica.com. Check us out on IRN Radio, uh, yeah, IRN, uh, 
Radio Network, and be sure to check, a, check out our podcast version of the show. Available iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, uh, SoundCloud, anywhere good listening is heard. So uh, tomorrow on the program, tune in as we have, I want to say it's uh, Sandy Berger, and it is Sandy Berger. Tune in tomorrow as we have uh, our guest Sandy Berger and another great episode of Computer America. So until next time, everyone, have a great day. Catch you tomorrow. Bye-bye.